previously in the complete creation. But in spite of the overwhelming evidence, those who do not want to believe will not believe. There is none so blind as those who will not see. And when confronted with the overwhelming evidence, some diehard adherents to the religion of evolutionism have actually suggested in print that rather than being human footprints, these are actually the footprints of aliens who came to visit Earth during the time of the dinosaurs. Or perhaps it is evidence of time travelers going back in time to see the dinosaurs. My response to both suggestions is that A, that is a suggestion that requires more blind faith than I'm willing to give. And B, did these alien creatures with obviously very sophisticated technology that enabled them to travel the cosmos to planet Earth, did they, you know, forget to bring their space boots? If they were the footprints of time travelers, why are the majority of footprints made by barefoot humans? Where's the Nike logo or the logo of whatever shoe manufacturer is from the future that this time traveler left? Thank you for joining me again for the next part in this exhaustive series. We spent the past six lectures studying the volumes of evidence that humans and dinosaurs did coexist. And in parts 10 and 11, we looked at the fossil dinosaur beds, which show the overwhelming evidence of the global flood. Now, those were the dinosaurs killed during the flood of Noah's day. But I left off the last lecture with a tantalizing topic that I will have to disappoint everyone by not diving into. The ridiculous numbers of reports of what appear to be dinosaur-like creatures still alive today. We're not talking about people on drugs, <laughs> but your average people and respectable leaders, wherever these eyewitness accounts may happen. And the reports are literally found all over the world. Sadly, due to time constraints, I have to defer that topic, but will simply point you to people like my Canadian partner, Bill Gibbons, who has led multiple expeditions to the Congos of Africa, pursuing the creature called Mokili Mbembe. Or... Herb Stein from the U.S., who has conducted a ridiculous amount of first-hand research into pterodactyl-like creatures found all over North America and Mexico, as well as Jonathan Whitcomb at livingpterosaur.com. And of course, Vance Nelson's fantastic coffee table book, Dire Dragons, where he shows copious examples of dinosaurs in historic artwork demonstrating that the artists saw these creatures in historic times. I only mention this fascinating topic in passing because it raises the question, did Noah bring dinosaurs on the ark? If there are some still alive today, then that means Noah did bring dinosaurs on the ark, and they have either become or are becoming extinct today. But first, what does the Bible have to say about all of this? Let's take a look at what God said in his very specific warning to Noah and instructions to build the ark. In Genesis 6, it explains why God brought judgment. Basically, man had become exceedingly wicked. In particular, man had become violent. But notice, back in Genesis chapter 1, that man was given specific instruction to subdue the earth, or understand and control it, and this included the animals. Man was given dominion 
over all the earth, including the animals. The fall of man in the Garden of Eden brought negative consequences for the earth and animals, as man evidently became corrupt and violent, and the animals over which man was given dominion followed suit. The message over and over again was that the flesh of earth, man and animal, had become violent. This is what God was saying some 1,600 years after creation and the fall of man. Notice the stark contrast between this time and the way things were as originally created before the fall of man. There was no eating of flesh. The food for man, animals, and even insects was to be plants. So God found himself grieved that he had made man and animals and decided to destroy them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That single sentence, that single verse, is going to have profound significance momentarily because, because God leaves out no detail. So God shows up to Noah, warns him of the flood to come, and gives specific instructions to build the ark. He tells him to build it out of gopher wood and to cover it inside and outside with pitch. To build it to the dimensions of 300 by 50 by 30 cubits with a one cubit high window, presumably the length of the ark, and to build three main stories inside. Now, for those not aware, a cubit was a dimension based on the arm length of the current king, from the elbow to the tip of the fingers. Obviously, this dimension would vary somewhat, but it's about a foot and a half. So this would mean, by our modern-day dimensions, that the arc would have been about 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. In metric, that would be roughly 137 by 23 by 14 meters. Immediately, atheists and anti-creationists hurl ridiculous memes like this one, mocking Noah's Ark by comparing it to the Titanic. Wait, look at this. The Ark wasn't anywhere near as big as the Titanic, which was built of steel, and the known capacity for this super vessel was almost 600 times smaller than what the Ark needed to carry. Now, while most of their data I would agree with, <laughs> this is clearly a straw man argument on so many levels that they should be ashamed of themselves for even trying to pull this laughable stunt. I mean, do you think the Titanic had to carry two million insects? Obviously, the Titanic had insects on board, though not intentionally. <laughs> and leaving aside that baseless number, two million insects wouldn't take that much space anyway. But right off the bat, there's simply no comparison between the Titanic and Noah's Ark. Take a look at the interior of the Titanic, which, although it was considerably larger than the Ark, a huge portion of the volume of the Titanic's capacity is consumed by the coal chutes and its 29 massive boiler, boilers, the gargantuan engine and drivetrain. The Ark was constructed to float and survive. That was it. It didn't need propulsion systems. It didn't need navigation and communication systems. It didn't need nothing. It was just a big box that had to stay structurally sound, float, and survive. Next, I'm going to show you a series of drawings and pictures showing what the interior of these two vessels is believed to have looked like. See if you can spot which are from the Titanic and which are from Noah's Ark. A grand staircase going down five flights. A Café Parisienne. A barber shop. The telegraph room. The veranda cafe. A squash court. Onboard swimming pool. Mail room and post office. A smoking room. 
a gym and a workout room, Turkish baths, and of course, st state rooms for the people. And if you haven't figured it out yet, this is satire. And every one of those images is from the Titanic or its twin sister ship, the Olympic. I mean, come on, guys. This is the best you can do. <laughs> this is your attempt at mocking the idea of Noah's Ark. I'm not mocking you. You are mocking yourself. Furthermore, where did you get these numbers from? You obviously didn't even lift a finger to think through those numbers. Nor did you calculate just how much volume that would all take. But don't you worry. The creationists have done that work for you. John Wood Morpey's fantastic book, Noah's Ark, A Feasibility Study, is a fascinating must-read. I love the way John thinks through these things to actually evaluate the challenge and whether or not the Noah and, Ar Noah and the Ark story, as written in the Bible, was even feasible. So, most of the numbers I'm about to share here come from Woodmore P's study. First, we already know the dimensions of Noah's Ark. I have here a scale model of Noah's Ark with some railroad boxcars beside it to give you an idea of the sheer volume of the Ark. The Ark would have had the equivalent volume of 569 50-foot boxcars. God's instructions to Noah were quite clear about taking limited numbers of land animals, mammals, and birds, plus the eight individuals of Noah's family. Amphibians, insects, and marine animals were not taken. Furthermore, using modern canines as an example, all dogs, coyotes, foxes, and other canines, probably descended from one type of wolf-like canine. Thus, we can achieve the incredible diversity we see in the animal kingdom today from one pair of wolf-like dog. Now, before someone gets all excited and starts ranting about how that's hyper-evolution, well, okay, if you wish to cite dogs evolving into dogs and losing genetic diverse diversity in later generations and call that hyper-evolution, then go for it. But dogs evolving into dogs does not exactly help your case for macroevolution. The bottom line is that for this incredible variety of canines, you only need one pair of wolf-like canines on the Ark. But let's take this a step farther. Here I have the skull of a hadrosaur dinosaur. Just the skull. Some of the sauropods were over 130 feet or 40 meters long, but they were, by definition, land animals that breathed air. Therefore, Noah was supposed to take at least two of each of them. Where are you going to put them? On the roof racks? <laughs> or perhaps there is a simpler and better solution. Here I have a hadrosaur dinosaur egg that I showed you previously. Compare the size of the hadrosaur when it was born to the size of the adult. Noah wouldn't bring adult animals on the ark. He would bring juveniles. I mean, think about it. They don't eat as much. They don't drink as much. They don't take up a lot of space. They sleep lots. They don't go to the bathroom much. That's important. When they get off the ark, they are young and have a full reproductive life ahead of them as they need to repopulate the earth. Noah would have brought juvenile animals on the ark. Based on the numbers from the Bible, Woodmore P. estimated that Noah probably had approximately 16,000 animals on the ark. Now think about the average size of all animals, mice, birds, lizards, hogs, dogs, cows, horses, uh, right up to elephants and other large animals. The average size is approximately that of a sheep. Now let us disregard the fact that Noah would have brought juvenile animals on the ark and assume that the average size for all 16,000 animals is about the size of a sheep. 
So back in the days where livestock was routinely transported by rail, animals were transported in converted boxcars. An average double-decker stock car held about 240 sheep. We will designate the majority of the boxcar for food and water and limit the animal capacity at 30 sheep per car. So the capacity of Noah's Ark would be the equivalent of 17,070 animals with food and water for a year and room for another 1,000 animals to spare. Noah could have easily fit all the animals on the ark. Now, many skeptics claim, even with all of our advanced modern technologies today, we cannot build a ship 450 feet long out of wood. There is a pile of arrogance and ignorance in that argument, and firm roots in evolutionary thinking. The assumption is that we have superior technology and knowledge, and if we do not know how it can be done, then clearly the ancients could not have done it. The evolutionary assumptions are that man has increased in intelligence over time. Therefore, Noah and his family were not as intelligent as us. Oh yeah? Then use your superior in intellect and modern technology to build me a pyramid like the ones at Giza. We know how long it took them to build the Great Pyramid and when it was built, based on the records of the Greek historian Herodotus, it took 20 years during the reign of Egyptian pharaoh Khufu. As Mladyov and Mladyov point out in their fascinating paper, there's 2.3 million blocks in the Great Pyramid which need to be cut from the nearby quarry, transported and emplaced with incredible precision in the construction to the tune of 426 blocks per day. Each block weighed an average of 2.85 tons. Even with modern technology and heavy equipment, we would be hard pressed to do that. This is so baffling to our modern arrogant minds that there is a growing number of people who believe aliens with superior technology built the pyramids. Actually, we know how they built the pyramids, and it was simply smart people. They used techniques similar to those used to emplace the 1,000-ton Trilithon stones in the foundation of what is now the Temple of Jupiter at Baalbek in Lebanon. All of these stones were laid by the Romans on top of this foundation, which was already there when the Romans got there. Somebody else before their time <laughs> had technology sophisticated enough to precisely cut and transport 1,000 ton blocks many kilometers and then precisely emplace them in the construction. There is even one of the stones still left in the quarry, known as the Stone of the Pregnant Woman. With all of our sophisticated modern technology, we would be hard-pressed to match this feat. When I was running freight trains here in Canada, the locomotives we used on the Trans-Canada Line were around 200 tons each. These blocks are the equivalent weight of five of those locomotives. Now, I could go on literally for hours about the incredible technologies the ancient peoples had that are a slap in the face for those who would contend that ancient man was a dumb brute. That is a false evolutionary assumption. That assumption is that we evolved from less intelligent apes. Therefore, we have increased in intelligence over time. Actually, I would argue that the opposite is the observable case. We have lost intelligence over time. So, coming back to Noah's Ark, just because we don't know how to build a ship that large out of wood <laughs> does not mean that they didn't. The skeptics point to ships such as the schooner called the Wyoming. 
built in 1909. It was 450 feet long, but because of its great length, it had a nasty habit of twisting the hull and letting water in. Eventually, it sank in a bad storm, which may or may not have actually been the result of the problems caused by the wooden hull. The ship was lost with all hands, and the wreck was only discovered in 2003. It was noted that it may very well have struck ground. That area is littered with shipwrecks for these very reasons. Nevertheless, the Wyoming successfully sailed for some 15 years. But also notice the stark differences between the Wyoming and the Ark. Noah's Ark was a barge designed for strength and survivability, not a streamlined ship for moving quickly through the water. Furthermore, in the 1400s, the Chinese had the largest fleet in the world of what they called the Treasure Fleet, led by Admiral Zheng He. The largest ships, called the Baoshuan, which literally means gem ship, were larger than 450 feet long. But there has been some debate over whether or not those claims are accurate or not. Why? <laughs> because we don't know how to build a ship that big out of wood. Archaeological remnants of the dry docks are gargantuan in dimensions, large enough to build ships of that size. Why on earth would you build such a huge dry dock if you weren't going to build a ship that large? Just because you can't build it does not mean that they could not. Archaeology and history does not bear witness that your knowledge is superior to the knowledge and skills of the ancients. Noah and his family could have easily constructed the enormous ark even with very simple machines, as can be seen in this animatic for the Noah Flood movie. An animatic is basically a very rough draft animated storyboard which is rendered to give, to give uh, filmographers, actors, and editors a visual representation of what the final film will look like. So we build the animatic, so everybody can figure out where they, where they or the cameras need to be, where the lighting needs to be, etc. Then they go out and actually film. But Stephen did a fantastic job here just showing from a simple and practical way how Noah and his family could have built the Ark. And remember, if you go with the conventional dating of the Egyptian pharaoh Khufu, that was very shortly after Noah's time. The Egyptians were cutting stone with rotary saws, as you can see the saw marks in some stones still today. You can see they were turning stone pillars on giant lathes. So the technology and machines shown in this animatic are truly simple, even for Noah's day. Vance Nelson presented a compelling case for the shape of Noah's Ark in his fantastic book, Flood Fossils, which you can get at untoldsecretsofplanetearth.com. The shape of Noah's Ark turns out to be surprisingly important. That very word Ark means box or coffin. The description laid out in Genesis chapter 6 indicates a box shape. And God told Noah to build it out of gopher wood, and to cover it inside and out with pitch. Well, what on earth is gopher wood, and what was that pitch? Noah's Ark is hugely symbolic of Christ, and as it turns out, even the very construction method of Noah's Ark alludes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gopher is not a type of tree or wood, but rather a wood process. A process of, build, of building up crisscrossed layers or wafers of material. When the French came over to Canada, they named groundhogs gophers because the gophers would dig their tunnels in layers which crisscrossed each other. 
And here in Canada, where goods need both English and French languages, you can see the French word gopher on the wafer cookies. The cookies are made of layers, the gophering process. The Jewish tradition was that Noah used birch resin for the pitch, which acted as a glue and a waterproofing. I put together a science short for my Tech Valley Science Center, where I show how you can make this pitch and even make some crude gopher wood. The ancient Egyptians had tradesmen whose expertise was in glues, and undoubtedly they had this resin in their arsenal. Tools and weapons associated with the Neanderthals have used this birch resin, which modern-day scientists refer to as a superglue, surpassing the quality of some of our modern-day glues. So basically, Noah's Ark was built of really thick, crisscross laminated plywood. Now, unfortunately, I am out of time once again, and we'll have to carry on this topic in the next lecture. I hope you'll join me again. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. Baptism was symbolic of the flood of Noah. When Christ was baptized, the Apostle Luke records that the Spirit of God descended on Christ in the form of a dove. Why a dove? It was further symbolism to Noah and the great flood. Noah released a dove from the vessel of salvation from God's judgment, and the dove never returned. Now the dove was returning and landing on another vessel, which was to save people from the judgment to come. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support.